without further ado, I am so excited to introduce Jenny. Um, Jenny, so you can you can turn on your video um, and I'll hand over the screen to you shortly. Um, but a little bit about Jenny. Um, as the community program manager of HubSpot, Jenny has been at the forefront of scaling an enterprise SaaS community for over five years. Jenny's created programs to scale HubSpot's community from a support forum to an engaged platform. And at her core, Jenny enjoys helping people and feels fortunate to have built a community that has helped millions of people find answers, connections, and to learn from their peers. Welcome, Jenny. We're so excited to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, I'm going to come back on at the 45 minute mark and we can jump into some Q&A. All right, sounds good. I'll share my screen. Cool. All right. So the way that you can stay present during this is we will keep track of how many corny courting jokes there are. Um, and if someone has a tally at the end, you'll win a hug from me virtually. <laughs> Um, but I'm very excited to talk with you all today. So a little bit more about me. Doo, doo, doo. Um, so I am Jenny. I've been working at HubSpot for over six years, primarily based out of our Cambridge office. And I joined the HubSpot uh, company before our community even launched. So that's how old I am. <laughs> um, and I was fortunate enough to join our team just as our community started being built and have been on the crazy ride that is community management ever since. Outside of work, I love to travel. So in addition to talking community, if you ever want to talk about travel or get tips, definitely hit me up. I'm happy to chat about them. And I am very much an ideas person. I get my joy and I get my energy just from discussing big topics um, and thinking through things at a high level. So whether it's travel related or community related, I'm always happy to brainstorm with anyone and everyone. So to give you a little insight about the HubSpot community, um, as one of my coworkers said, it's always good to like prove your credentials at the beginning of something like this. So this is the community that I've been in charge of building for the past several years. Our community is six years old. We have over 200,000 members. Our community is in six languages. We have some of our uh, regional community managers in the audience today. And we have over 100 community champions. So that's our super user program. So if I say champions instead of super users, just know I'm talking about the same thing. That's just how we've branded it here at HubSpot. And today, what we're going to discuss. So first and foremost, building that profile. That's joke number one of your super user. Um, and then we'll talk about how you can kind of take that profile turn it into a lasting relationship. And then finally, an important part of this obviously is retaining those folks, scaling your program. And then we will wrap up with that Q&A because I'm sure there are things that I'm not covering and I definitely wanna get some of those questions from you all. Cool. So diving right in, building your super user. So before you even start thinking about having a super user program in your community, the first thing you wanna do is set your standards. You have to know who you're looking for, there's gonna be dozens, hundreds, hopefully eventually thousands of folks who could potentially be super users. And you wanna make sure that you're really, you know, picking the folks who are there for the right reasons. So the three things that you wanna keep in mind are the purpose of your community, the business value that these folks are gonna be providing, as well as the member themselves. So looking at each of those in a bit more detail, the purpose of your community. There are many types of communities um, that can be built and hopefully you've already started building your community before you start going looking for super users. But the type of folks that you're going to be bringing into this program, they're going to vary dramatically depending upon what type of community you're building. So if you have a community of practice versus a support community, the right persona for a super user is going to differ, right? Because a community of practice, you're looking for folks who want to start conversations or logging in every day or sharing pictures and you know trends and all that good stuff a support community you're looking for folks who can actually just come in and want to answer questions have those peer-to-peer -peer conversations um, and really have like the q a style conversations so those are two very different personas my pro tip here is when you're looking for these folks and you're thinking about this use existing resources this is not like you don't need to go reinvent the wheel here 
um, you can go use the wonderful world of Google to find resources about what these personas are, what your success metrics look like, um, which is the next key thing here, right? So obviously you need to have metrics for your community as well as for your super users. Don't just be like, oh, we want to have so many friends here. It's going to be amazing. You have to actually think about what you want them to do when they come in and what success looks like. And then going down to the next one there, a good transition. What does a successful community look like? Start manifesting what this community is. Not only, you know, when you launch your super users program, but five years from now, 10 years from now, what do you want this space to be? What do you want these folks to bring? And where do your super users fit within that story? Are they front and center? Are they, you know, a super important arm of the community that you're getting feedback from? Think about how they fit into the bigger ecosystem. Because again, as you start searching for these folks, these are all things you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind. And next, think about the business. So communities are obviously about um, the folks in your community, your members, but at the end of the day, your community is sponsored by your business. And so making sure you have a good understanding about what part of the business strategy your super users are going to play is very important. I think the simplest way to think about this is that your super users are either helping you save money or they're helping you make money. So just make sure you have that distinction in mind because they're again, two very different personas. And how are they gonna help spin that flywheel? So think about the different ways that your community, and again, it kind of goes back to the purpose of whether you have a support community or an engagement community, whatever the case may be, but think about how you want your super users to help spin that. Are they helping bring new leads into your community channel? Are they helping retain folks? Um, are they keeping support costs down? Think about how they're gonna move that lever because that also will help you one, get buy-in from your business, but two, help you understand what sort of folks you're looking for. And then think about the customer stories you wanna have on your community. Your community, whether you like it or not, is going to become a huge database of information and stories and just assets about your company and about your business. So think about the kind of stories that you wanna have front and center. Are these success stories where someone scaled from being a solopreneur to an enterprise CEO? Are they success, success stories about nonprofits? Think about those sort of things so that you're weaving that into the people that you're pulling into your super user program. And then finally, obviously, most importantly are the members and thinking about why someone actually wants to become a super user. This is like the elevator pitch. You should have this pretty button down before you start going and looking for these folks because if you get into a conversation with them and they're like, well, what's in it for me and you don't know, it's not gonna be great. Um, and again, I think it's just important for these folks to kind of, you know, have insight as to what they're signing up for, what's expected of them and what they're gonna get in return. Um, there are tons of benefits that members will get from being in your super user program. Don't get me wrong. I think anyone who's in a community outside of work, if you're in that, you know, super user experience, you know that it's fun to get swag and it's fun to get thought leadership opportunities, but make sure you're thinking about what these folks want and what they are going to be getting, um, in return for being a part of this program. And then the like mantra that you should have throughout all of this is really that the value that your super users are getting should feel to them like more value than they're giving. So the, whatever it is, if it's, you know, the 10% discount on your services, if it's the fabulous t-shirt and mug and <laughs> cooler bag that you're sending them at the holidays, that should feel like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing this for me. I can't believe that they're sprinkling me with this delight. And that is way more value than them taking 30 minutes out of their day to come into the community and post a picture, ask a question, reply to a question. So just always keep that in mind. You should always feel like you're giving them more than you're getting from them. Cool. And then before you even start looking for these folks, you should start building this program. So you need to have buy-in. Don't do this in a silo. Community people, we we work so well cross-functionally, but sometimes we do work in a silo too. So make sure you are sharing this with anyone and everyone at your company so that one, your sales folks, when they're on calls, they are, you know, ready to go. They have the literature about this, um, but also, you know, like your manager and your CEO, this should be stuff that they're aware of and really excited about. Again, going back to that purpose and the business side, you have all that in place. So when you're doing the sales pitch with them to get them hyped, they already know what's going on. And then if you can get a little budget, that is always helpful. This is not a deal breaker. I think, think about if 
if you can't get budget out of the gate, which to be transparent, we didn't have budget. I didn't have budget when I launched our community champions program. So it's not a deal breaker, but do think about how you can get budget long-term or, you know, if you're doing kind of like a good, better, best situation to lay it out for leadership, let them know what that budget could get them in that best column. And then benchmarks, you should know what success looks like, have those goals, have those KPIs in place. So again, that you're not just going out being like, we're growing, it's amazing know what you want to grow towards, how you want to grow, and then you can hold yourself accountable to those goals and pivot as needed if you're not meeting those goals. So a few examples of what this looks like. This is our landing page for our champions program. We do let folks apply to become champions, so just something to know. Um, and this is something I can kind of chat about this in a minute too, but just know that there are ways that you can kind of just start teasing it out to folks and let them know that this is an opportunity it also having something like this just makes it legit. And again, kind of, you know, you're setting the program up, you're saying, hey, it's live before you even have champions in place, which is great. And then the next thing, these are just our guidelines for our champions. This is um, one version of our guidelines, but it's important to put pen to paper around all this before you have these folks coming in because you need to be able to share this with them from day one have everything and anything in mind that you want them to know on this paper so that they're you know, almost like a contract so that they know what they're signing up for. And the main CTA that I'll call out here is the fact that we're one in this document pretty early on asking for their feedback. And we're being transparent here and saying this isn't everything, right? We want your feedback. We want to continue to iterate on this, but let us know, give us that feedback. Um, when I first launched our champions program, I positioned everything as having them be the freshman class of champions because I wanted them to know that we were doing this together. And I wanted them to know that, you know, the words that I'm typing in the perks that we're offering are going to change. And so asking for their feedback often uh, is a great way to, to just make sure they understand that they're a part of this with you. All right, so into the meat here, how to actually find and keep your super users. Lurker to long-term. So it all starts with just being a lurker, right? Um, you know, this is where love starts to bud. People start to wonder who you are. And then there are some steps you can take to kind of find those lurkers and pull them in and turn them into um, a long-term relationship, if you will, and make it, make it a steady thing, make it official. So we'll go through these steps in a bit more detail, but just, I think the main theme here is that you're kind of backing into this. You're not doing anything. You're not coming in hot and being like, oh my God, hi, this is amazing. You're here, let's chit chat. You're very much being subtle, you're being coy, maybe you're playing hard to get. Um, whoever's keeping track of the jokes there, you can take another ticker. Um, and then, you know, you're you're making it official when it makes sense. So, lurkers, remember, no one starts as a super user. No one, it's impossible for someone to join your community and automatically have 10 accepted solutions, 50 replies, 200 upvotes, that's impossible. Everyone starts with the same metrics of zero across the board. So I think that's important to keep in mind. These folks don't, you know, no one's born into this. No one starts as this. And so it's your job as whatever your position is at your company to start kind of sniffing around and looking for these folks. Um, every community is going to have lurkers, right? It's kind of like the starting path for everyone. So whether your community is on day two and it just launched, or if your community's five years old, these people are still showing up, they're in the background. And so all you're doing at this point is just looking for them. And the key here is to use your data. Uh, you need to know who is looking and not acting. So data is going to be key here. And just start seeing who you find, who are the people who are coming into your, your community on a very regular basis. They kind of get it, right? Maybe they're not engaging yet, but they see the value they're viewing, you know, five pages a day for three weeks, or they're coming in three times a week and looking at one spot specifically, and they seem to be really checking it out and just, just poking around in there. So that's really the start here. You're just looking for these folks. You're not even acting on it yet. You're just, you're in the background, you've manifested, you know what the priorities are, you have your ideal person in mind, and you're just looking for them. And then you're subtle. Right. So you're going to this is a slow burn situation. We're not coming in too hot. If they are posting content, upvote it. Just be subtle in the background. If they do reply, I think it's important to remember. Sometimes it can be very tempting to be like, oh, my God, and get into a very technical explanation and want to really dive deep with these fresh faces. 
and that can be a little bit much. So all you have to do is just say, thank you for sharing, you know, appreciate that you've come here, just that sort of thing, very casual. If you do see them viewing certain boards quite a bit, if you can kind of start to sniff out what their specialty is, tag them into conversations in that space and see if they take the bait, see if they're interested and they want to participate. Um, I think something worth noting here too is you can't force people to be a super user. If someone doesn't get it, they're not going to get it. So the key here is to kind of weed out the people who don't want to be super users and find the people who you actually should start building that relationship with. And these are some techniques that will ensure that you're actually finding the people who understand the value. Um, and by being subtle, you know, they, they see that you see them. And that's part of it, right? It's just that in a crowd of 100, 1,000, even 10 or 50 people, when you make that one-to-one -one connection and you tag a specific person into the conversation, that is worth your time in gold, right? It's just so nice. People just want to be seen these days, especially online. It can be very hard. You can feel very anonymous. And so for you to take the time and just tag them in and say, hey, you know, welcome. I see you. Thank you for sharing. Um, or even more so, hi, you know, Santa Claus, I thought you might be interested in replying to this. Do you have any thoughts on this? That is just like over the moon. Oh my gosh, they see me. I'm not just a number. I'm a person to them. And that is you know, going to be very useful in this situation. Um, and then going back to the data, track that engagement. So how is this going? Don't just like tag people willy nilly and reply to things and, you know, fingers crossed, we hope it works. Track it to see for the folks that you did tag in, how many of them came back? Did they come back to the conversation? You know, which conversation did they come back to? Um, did the people that you replied to their posts and just said, thank you? Did they come back more often than the people you didn't reply to? And just keep an eye, see if it's working and see who's kind of starting to understand the value here. And then the next thing, you're actually gonna get to chat with them one-on-one. -on -one. You're gonna slide into their DMs. So by this point, they should know who you are in some sense because you have made that one-to-one -one connection. So either you've upvoted their content, you've replied to their content, you've tagged them into a conversation, they know your avatar, you're not a stranger at this point. And this is where you get to actually reach out and say, hi. Um, the key thing here, whenever possible, meet them on the platform that you are working on together. So if you're on Slack, Slack message them. If you're in a community software, we use Koros. If you're in something like Koros, if you have the DM feature enabled, DM them in there. Um, I will tell you from experience, if you go straight to emailing them, it's not going to go well. You, It's weird, right? They're like, how did you find my email? What is this? So you want to make it casual. This is where you've already established your relationship. You've connected one-on-one. -on -one. So continue the conversation there. It's going to seem a lot more organic and it's going to make a lot more sense in their minds than if you reach out through a different channel. So whenever possible, just send them a DM where you are. This DM is not you saying, you know, please become a super user. Welcome to our community champions program. This is you just saying, hi, again, I see you. I appreciate what you're doing. How is it going so far? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, and just kind of introduce yourself. If you can't DM them on your community, I know some community platforms don't use DM, see if you can get an email intro from a friendly face at your company. So if there's a salesperson that they're working with, if they have an account manager, connect with that person and see if they can start the email. Because again, it's just going to seem a lot better if you have a mutual connection and they say, hey, Jenny wanted to be connected with you. If you have, you know, a couple minutes to chat with her, she'd appreciate it. Um, and when in doubt, if that is not possible for whatever reason, I think LinkedIn is very much like the lobby of networking. So it's, you know, everyone's sharing their LinkedIn profiles here. It's not sketchy for someone to reach out to you on LinkedIn bring the conversation and the context of why you're reaching out to them to LinkedIn. Say, hi, I'm the community manager at this company. I saw that you've been active in that space and I wanted to connect. Um, but whenever possible, just go in through like the most casual door you can, as opposed to doing some sort of email blast that just feels like icky and strange. And they're just going to be grossed out because again, I can tell you from experience, it won't go over well. And then once you've DM'd them or emailed them or whatever your connection is, you want to make a date. You want to book a meeting, as the case may be. Um, and the goal of this meeting is just to kind of, in that one-on-one, -on -one, you've been chatting, right? This is, you know, like 
you're in a dating app, this is you actually like going on a date with the person to see if you actually like them. Um, you want to see if it, if it's a match. You want to see if the goals and everything that you put in place at the beginning, does this person actually align with what you're looking for? So things to think about in this meeting are their business goals um, and your business goals. Why are they in this community space? If you are in a support community and you're looking really for people who want to be thought leaders and want to answer questions and someone you know you meet with someone and they're like oh well i'm actually just trying to get people to follow me on TikTok." well that's probably not going to be the best fit for your super users program because you're not going to be getting what you want from them and they're probably not going to be getting what they want from your community um and then just really focus the conversation on them getting value i think Again, going back to it should always feel like they're getting more value. If you can position yourself in this meeting just by saying, how can I help you? What do you need? Let's talk about this. Let's make a plan. Do you want to host an AMA in our community? Do you want me to tag you in more conversations? Do you want me to, you know, uh, this wouldn't be super scalable, but in early days, email you a list of conversations I think you could participate in. Tactics like that, I know Anton, we, Anton's one of our champions, so it's fun to have, it's a little scary to have him in this, in this chat, but <laughs> he's seeing the secret sauce and the behind the scenes of how, how I courted you, Anton. Um, but think about, you know, what can you do for them to make sure that they want to stick around? And then once you've had that conversation and you leave that meeting and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a match, you have butterflies, you're so happy, you get to actually make it official and invite them into that super users program. This is where we're taking the um, all the documentation that you put in place before we even started looking for these folks. You're bringing this to them, you're giving it to them, and you're saying, this is what's expected of you. It should be so, so clear because what you never want to happen is for there to be a misalignment down the road where you say, you know what, you're actually expected to be answering 20 topics a month and you're only answering five and someone says, well, that's not in the documentation. So if you need to have even some sort of like onboarding cohort with these folks so that they know what's expected of them, it's worth it to do all of that upfront because there shouldn't be any surprises and you don't wanna burn these people. Once they're in your inner circle, you need to treat them like family. So take the time, make sure that this is set up the right way and they know anything and everything that they should know. Also let them know what they're gonna get in return. If you're gonna give them tickets to something, don't hide that. If you're gonna send them welcome swag, you know, ask for their address and say, there's a special surprise coming your way. If you're just gonna send out a little a LinkedIn message and just give them a little shout out on LinkedIn, take the time to ask for their preferred photo so that you're not you know, taking something from 2005 that they don't like. Let them know what they're getting, because again, we're getting their buy-in, we want them to know we're being transparent, and I think the more you can share all of that upfront, the more trust you're going to get from these folks and the more they're going to want to stick around. And then my personal favorite part, you get to actually position yourself or someone on your team as the point of contact for these folks, and I like to call myself the HubSpot genie for these folks. So they should feel like they can bring you any request within the ecosystem of your company and you should be able to action that request so no matter if it's getting into a beta if it's connecting with another champion if it's connecting with your chief product officer whatever the case may be they should feel like you can do it for them um, and i will say if you've done your homework at the beginning and you've shared all this with your leadership and you've gotten that buy-in when you go to these people and you say, someone wants to meet with you, or can I get this person into this beta, you will get less pushback because you've educated them correctly and they understand the value that these folks are bringing to the company. So this is my favorite part. And I, it, 10 out of 10 times, I would say, maybe like 9.5 out of 10 times, I'm able to action pretty much every request. Um, use your internal network. You know, I'm not expecting you all to be able to like put people in betas and everything just on your own, build up that network of internal folks who can help you with this. And then as much as you can, just take care of these kids because they deserve it. Also important to talk about red flags, right? So some of these folks, you might start chit chatting with them and you'll find out that it's actually not the best fit. Um, and so a few things to keep in mind as you start going through this pipeline with folks. First and foremost, don't rush into anything. There's something that I call like the shooting star effect, and that is someone who does try to become a super user overnight. 
and they're replying to everything. It seems like they're always online. They're just this there and everywhere for like two weeks and then they're gone. And if you act too quickly within those two weeks, that's not a good look because then you're just like letting the wrong people into your program. But it also, again, when it comes back to trust, people aren't going to trust you because there's going to be people joining your program. And it's like, well, they just signed up for the community. I had to wait. Why are they here? Um, and then it's going to lead to a lot of folks having to leave the program because they're not meeting the goals that you've put in place and what's expected of them. Our rule at HubSpot, you have to be active for at least three months before we let you into the program. Um, it will differ depending upon how old your community is, the pattern of your community users. So three months is not like, you know, the standard for everyone, but I think it is important to have a little lead time so that you can just make sure they're not running away and they're not just like there for a hot second to get the TikTok followers and then they're leaving. I think anyone who's leading with sales, it's just not a good look. If someone is just sharing their meetings link and they're not providing value to the conversation, then they're not a good fit because they're not there to help your community. They're there to help themselves. Too many links is just sketchy, right? If they're publishing something and there's as many links as there are sentences, that's not really providing value. So you always wanna make sure that the focus here is that these folks are actually providing value to your community as opposed to just getting their meetings link out there or getting backlinks to their website or whatever the case may be. All right, so now you've found these folks, you've welcomed them, it's official, it's amazing, things are going so well. How do we retain them and actually scale this program? So a couple things to keep in mind. Always going back to data, data is an important piece of this, track and segment your data. You want to check in with these super users and you want to iterate on your program, right? You want to keep the spark alive. We know that the first iteration may not be the best, um, so you want to make sure you're changing it with them. So the first thing, tracking your data. So whether it is in a Google Sheet, whether it's an Airtable, whether it is in HubSpot, I think we don't use HubSpot for this purpose, but I think HubSpot could be used to store your super user data. Just make sure that all the goodness that you're doing of lurk, you know, tracking your lurkers and being subtle, put all of that in some sort of place that you can refer back to it. This is, we have our data in, one of the places we have our data is in Airtable. And I refer to it as, I used to refer to it as my, if I get hit by a bus document, but now I refer to it as my, when I go to the Bahamas for a month document. Um, and you want to make sure that, you know, everybody's on the same page here. It's so important as you scale to, to have all this data available. And so just start tracking it early on. You'll get into some technical debt if you don't. So even if you feel really silly and you're like, I have four lines of data in here, um, just start it because I guarantee you it will grow quickly over time. And so when you are putting all that data in, a couple things you'll want to do, segment that data by life cycle stages. So this will kind of give you an overview of like the pipeline of growth that you're expecting for your super user program, because you're going to track how many lurkers you have, how many people did you tag into conversations this week, and what's that track, what does that track to for getting super users by the end of the quarter, by the end of the year, whatever the case may be. Um, five is, I think, a good number to start with, five or six for a life cycle stage. I would say no less than four because you do want to have distance between lurkers and super users. And again, when you're on the beach sipping your Mai Tais, you don't want people tagging in a lurker to respond to like a very technical question. So stretch it out, but don't make it too complicated that it's difficult for folks to follow. Um, and some other key segments to keep in mind are question askers, first and foremost. These are the folks who are never going to be super users. They are using your community. If you're to support community, which is what our community started as, these are the folks who are just asking questions on a very regular basis. But they're some of the best people. Um, we had one woman who was a question asker. She was asking questions every day. First of all, fabulous because she's creating content for our super users to actually reply to. But she was just creating all these conversations and some of the team members were like, this is noise, this isn't value. But I will tell you, when something went wrong, if there was something that I needed to see, such as someone spamming the community, someone yelling at someone in the community, she was emailing me and DMing me faster than our spam filters. She was on top of it. And so even though she was never going to be a super user, I still really valued having her data in there because 
it meant I was good. You know, we were keeping track of who was going to help us. Basically, she was a friendly face. So question askers, well, they're not going to become your super users. It's just important to keep them, you know, in in top of mind, if you will. Troublemakers, I don't think I need to say more about that. <laughs> um, but I think the main thing that you can do here is as you do have folks, hopefully this is a very small list, but um, if you do have folks who are causing trouble and you have like a three strikes you're out policy when it comes to banning them or putting them in timeout, keeping track of that somewhere in this sort of database is gonna be super helpful so that you know if you're offline and someone in Singapore needs to give them their next strike, that's documented so you're all on the same page there. And then the graveyard, these are the folks who did for whatever reason move on to greener pastures and they used to be super users, but they have they no longer are still very valuable information. You can filter it out. And I'm not saying you need to be looking at this on like a daily basis, but still keep it there because again, this is someone you don't know. This person could have gone on parental leave for three years. And when they come back after three years, you don't want to greet them as if they're brand new and be like, hi, welcome to the community. We're so happy to have you here. You know, start by introducing yourself and have that person come in and say, I know what I'm doing. I was already here. I'm, you know, just back to work or whatever the case may be. So just keep track of that so that your team is all aware of it. You know, it's historical data. It's still good data. Um, and it also will help you understand kind of the retention of your program and how you're doing with keeping these folks. Um, some fields to track. I won't linger on this too long, but I do think there are some non-traditional fields that you should be keeping uh, in mind when you are working with these folks. The first one, which I could, I could do a whole chit chat about this, but location is so important and you do want to be specific here, right? So it's not enough to know that someone is from the United States. You really want to know more specific than that. You want to know the state they're from. You want to know the city they're from. Um, and this is so that you're greeting them correctly within the community. And I think today, if you're in the US, it's a perfect example. We have a massive hurricane in Florida right now. And I would never want to tag in someone from Florida today and be like, hi, can you help us and answer this question? Or, hey, did you want to start a conversation today? That's just such a bad look. Um, so it's just so important to have this context available. And again, the more specific, the better, because it's just going to allow you to greet these folks with the empathy and just as a human, which is always my number one priority. So definitely keep track of the location. The other thing I'll say too, even regardless of where you are in the world, you know, we have access to global news in two seconds. So if you are hopping on a meeting with these folks, if you are sending them an email or DMing them even, take two seconds to just Google what's happening in their corner of the world, because you'll be surprised how much empathy and respect and just like, Thank you for asking you get when you actually have that connection with folks to say hey i noticed you're having flooding in your area i hope you're doing okay if there's anything we can do to help let me know so that's the end of my soapbox feel about location user type your ecosystem of your business has different types of users right so are these folks prospects are they customers are they partners are they former employees all of that is great context to have when you're tagging them into conversations or just chatting with them or thinking about what benefits they want from your program, right? Um, what a prospect wants, what a partner wants are probably going to be pretty different. So it's just helpful to keep, have that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about these folks. And then their superpowers, at least for HubSpot, our tools are massive and um, you never want to tag someone into something that they don't know. Even if someone is an expert in our CMS hub, if I tag them into an API conversation, one, that doesn't make them look or feel good because they're like, I can't help you. I don't know the answer here. But two, it just makes us look kind of silly because like we should know that information. So get as specific as you can here. Ask people too. It's one of the first questions we'll ask when we when we meet with champions is what are your superpowers? What questions do you want to answer? What do you enjoy? And then just keep track of all that data so that you're making sure you're actually tagging them in the right conversations. And then last login date and last reply date. So this is what I consider to be passive and active engagement within the community. Login date being passive, reply date being active. And this is where it's especially useful when you're looking for folks who are starting to kind of fade away from being a super user. These two dates should always as much as possible be the same date, right? And like ideally it's today and they're coming every day and they're talking. Um, but just make sure, you know, if someone starts logging in but they're no longer replying, 
that's when you want to reach out to them and just say, hey, how are things going? Is there anything I can be helping you with? Is, you know, are we not tagging you in the right conversations? Just check in with them because the longer you wait here, the harder it's going to be to actually bring them back into the community. So when in doubt, just track both of them and always make sure. The other thing too, I'd say is like, make sure this information is updated on a very regular basis so that when you're in the Bahamas, you know, your teammate isn't going in here and being like, great, everyone was here in April, but now it's the end of September and I have no idea who's active. So the more up to date it is, the better off you'll be. And then once you do get lucky enough to hopefully have some budget, just know there are systems in place that do all of this work for you and do it very well. This is Common Room, um, if you're not familiar with it, and just mainly wanted to just put it on your radar that like this isn't something that I'm expecting everyone to do manually forever. Um, there are tools that can help you do this. And then check in with these folks. So hashtag relationship goals, right? We're still, you want to keep the spark alive. You want to make sure these folks feel happy and delighted and all that good stuff. So first and foremost, exchange your information with them, right? So give them your email address once they're in this program. Make sure they know how to get in touch with you and that they're not going through like whatever, you know, if you do have DM and you don't check your DM super frequently, make sure they know the fastest way to find you. It'll help them feel important, but it also will help ensure that when you log in in the morning, you're taking care of them first thing. Plan dates with them, you know, plan some events, um, make opportunities for them to connect not only with one another, but also give them inside access to your company. So this is a really like easy, free way to have perks for these folks, um, connect them with your product team, connect them with your leadership, give them an hour AMA with your CEO. If you can, anyone and everyone that you can connect them with, make sure that you are able to bring them into the conversation. One, it's going to make for a healthier and happier company because your leadership is actually going to be getting feedback from people who know and love your products. But two, your champions, your super users will be so thrilled and delighted and happy to have those opportunities know their love language right not everyone wants a t-shirt or a mug some people really just want to be thanked on linkedin and so having an understanding of what again like the values that they want and why they're in this space keep that in mind when you're giving them that delight and trying to keep the spark alive and whether it's a t-shirt or just a thank you note sometimes i find that people just really appreciate being thanked in like a handwritten note um or you know just a shout out on linkedin from your company's handle or, you know, whatever the case may be, there's different ways to do it, but just keep that in mind. And then most importantly, really the best value you can give these folks is the value of them connecting with one another. These are the brightest and the smartest and the best of the best. And you are one person. And while you are in charge of keeping them all happy, if they can learn from each other and connect with one another, and you can kind of create a community within your community, it's going to be so good. Everyone's going to be so happy. Trust me. <laughs> um, we had at our inbound conference recently, we had an event that some of our community champions attended and they did not want to talk to me. They wanted to talk to each other. And so any opportunity that you can bring these folks together, let them learn from one another, let them chit chat, let them ask questions, mentor opportunities, even the happier they will be. And then iterate on your program, right? This thing is not a one and done. I was just talking about this with someone yesterday. There should be a V2, a V3, a V17. Um, it should always be continuing to grow and improve so that folks want to stay engaged. And that, you know, as your community scales, there's probably some things that are going to have to change. So the key things here to just keep in mind, clear expectations. If something is changing, let folks know. Don't Again, we don't want this to be a surprise for them. Um, and I think the other thing too, with expectations, try as much as you can not to have exceptions to the rule. So if you are, you know, if you're putting a three month waiting period in place that you have to be active for three months before you join, don't have someone skip to the front of the line and be like, oh, you can come in after three weeks because we trust you or whatever. That's just going to, again, kind of put some, some, uh, some, I don't even know what the word is. It's just going to make the trust. It's going to corrode the trust a little bit, I guess. And you don't want to do that. These are the best and the brightest. We want to keep them happy. Have detailed guidelines. Again, anything and everything these folks should know should be written down. There should be absolutely no surprises. Keep everything up to date. This isn't something that's sitting in the back of the closet. This is a document that you're working in often. 
um, as I was even putting screenshots of our documentation in there, I was like, we should have just on, like, obviously it says in our version of the Google doc, the last time it was updated, but it would be helpful for us to have updated on this date so that folks know that it is something that we're looking at that is up to date. And then track your impact and goals. Don't work in a silo, scream from the top of the mountains, the good work that you're doing and how many champions you're getting um, at HubSpot. Anyone who's works with me at HubSpot knows I am a big believer in showing your work and sharing your work and your champions work is going to be some of the most important work you're going to do. This is where you put in the time to actually build this program, make it what folks want so that it is successful because once it starts and once that flywheel starts spinning of, of super user growth, your community is just going to take off and you're going to be so, so happy that you put the time in. So definitely track your impact, track your goals and then share it out with anyone and everyone. And if you do all of this, you will feel like this. Your champions will complete you. Um, they are at HubSpot. They are part of our family. They're in our team. We try to treat them as well as we can. We don't take them for granted. And so just keep that in mind. Um, you know, just treat them well. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. If you want to connect, um, I will tell you in terms of Twitter, I am in the lurker stage. So I am still learning Twitter. <laughs> I'm waiting to be invited into the conversation. So give me some grace there, but follow along if you want to see a lurker in the midst. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Awesome. Jenny, that was so great. It was so actionable and just so witty. I love the theme um, and all the great examples you provided. Um, so we'll jump into the Q&A. Um, we have a lot of really great questions. Um, some of them, it looks like you kind of answered them as you went. Um, but let's see. Um, there's a great question here from Jeffrey. Um, how do you uh, how do you differentiate between a super user and an advocate? There are so many terms for these folks that get used interchangeably: ambassador, MVP, influencer, etc. What are the nuances between these roles, and how do you determine what kind of programs to run with each? Yeah, I think the way I think about it for our champions, at least, which is kind of like that's our super user program. That is one swim lane of advocacy. So that is really specifically focused on folks who are in our community space, taking actions within there. And then advocacy is kind of like the higher, the broader level that we look at for folks who just love HubSpot and want to scream about HubSpot. What I will say we've put a lot of time and effort into is making sure that even though there are different swim lanes of advocacy, so we also have our hub fans program and not everyone who is a champion is a hub fan and vice versa. What we do ensure is that the perks are the same for them so that there's never a reason that someone should feel they have to be a certain type of advocate because they're going to get the perks. It's just whatever they get the most joy from doing, we want to reward them for that. So for us, champions is just like within our community.hubspot.com but then we do have a broader advocacy program. Awesome. Um, question here from Ryan. Um, if you don't have a budget, then how do you entice super users to engage, um, such as how do you buy swag? Well, you could buy a sewing machine and just start sewing <laughs> swag. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, this is where I think, I mean, honestly, I think we're at a point now where people don't, like physical swag is fine, but like, that's not what is leading people's motivations to be engaged in a space. They want the opportunities to have AMAs. They want the opportunities to be, you know, screamed about on your homepage and to be spotlit in any capacity. The brand awareness and just whether it's their brand or it's just their personal brand, they that's what people want these days. And the fabulous thing is that is all free. So any way you can give folks that, whether it's your company's Twitter, you know, shouting them out when they get 50 solutions, whether it's you just kind of continuously mentioning folks on LinkedIn, there's a lot of free tools you have access to that if you put the machine of your company behind and use that to promote them, that's going to help their business more, which is, you know, important. Um, and it's free, which is great. So t-shirts are nice, but we have kind of moved away from that because people have enough mugs it's not you know it's not necessarily the best thing at the moment so yeah i totally agree 
Um, so just a quick reminder before we dive into the rest of the questions. Um, number one, I, I saw this question come up a ton of times in the chat. Yes, this event is being recorded and we're going to share the recording afterwards. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, and then for the Q&A, if you do have a question, please make sure to put it into the Q&A tab. Um, that's where I'm grabbing the questions from. I, I won't see it in the chat. Um, okay, so next question here is from Kat. Um, during the application process, how have you vetted applicants to ensure that you're bringing in super users with the best intentions for the community? It's a wonderful question. Um, I've, there are many here for the right reasons jokes that I can make, but I won't. Um, the, really, it does kind of take a manual level of going through their content. So we have some like general thresholds in place, like, you know, you have to be a top, you have to have like the gamified rank of top contributor, which by default is going to kind of filter out people who are brand new. Um, and it's going to ensure that we're only looking at folks who have actually like contributed to the community. But then you do want to kind of go through their content and just make sure that again, it's providing value as opposed to just being about that person. Um, and I think again, putting the waiting period in place here kind of sifts those people out because these people have to want to be there. And if you're still there after three months, chances are, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, but it is kind of manual and it is worth it to be a little manual just to review their content and make sure they're actually answering questions. Um, and if they're not, tell them that, you know, when you apply to the, when you reply to their application, say, we're excited about your enthusiasm. Right now your content is a little too focused on yourself and not really giving answers to our community. If you work on that over the next few months, we encourage you to reapply. Awesome. Um, I see a few related questions here um, from Giselle, Nicole, and Ellie. Um, can you just uh, dive a little bit more into um, metrics and the types of apps and, and platforms that you use to track um, any data about your folks? Um, I, you covered this a little bit, but if you maybe just want to review some of these. Yeah. So. The main metric we're looking at, well, kind of two sides of the same coin, but growth of this program and then retention of folks in this program. So we do that. We have most of our community data pulled into Looker. And when people become a community champion, in our case, we assign them the role of community champion. And so what we're looking at on a monthly basis is are we growing that number and are we losing anyone who did have that role and is no longer has that role? Um, you know, I think in terms of like how quickly a program should be growing, I do believe that slow and steady wins the race here. You don't want, if you are getting like 50 new community champions or super users every day, like you're probably not vetting them correctly. This should be like the absolute cream of the crop. Um, and then I know there's some research that says this stat is outdated, but they say like the top 1% of your community is where your super users sit. So if you're think if you're trying to put a benchmark in place about how many you should have, start by looking at 1% of like your logged in engaged members within your community. You're not going to that may be like, you know, even that may be unattainable, but use that as a benchmark for what you want to be growing towards um, over, you know, a long period of time. That's great. Super helpful. Um, interesting question here from Nicole. Um, is there time as a super user time boxed, um, for example, a year, or are they in for as long as, as they'd want to be once they're accepted? It's a very good question. So we have this in our documentation. It's not a lifetime membership. We review folks on a quarterly basis and you basically get like a probation period of a quarter to like start contributing again. And then if after that quarter, you're still not participating, we will email you. We try to get in touch with folks as much as we can, because it's not a good vibe to be like, bye, thanks for coming. Um, and to just have a conversation and see what's going on there, but a quarter probation, and then you're out of the program. I think realizing people are human, right? Like this, obviously people leave for parental leave, people go on sabbatical, things happen. So that's why the quarter for just having that conversation is key. And then you can kind of vibe out too. Like if people have been kind of fading away, maybe it's time for them to go. But if suddenly someone just disappears after a quarter, you maybe want to have a conversation and just say to them, you know, we don't want to lose you. So please come back and let me know if I can help you stick around. 
Awesome. Um, question from Rohit. Um, how do you identify your champions in the community um, in the early stages? And do you reach out to them personally um, or any other tips around that? Um, so I think this comes back to the fact that like you can't force people to get it. So as much as you can find people who are already in your platform, that's going to be to your benefit because you know, as with every community, if someone doesn't get it and you're like, yeah, it's this great space. And like, we're chatting and having a great time. And they're like, yeah, okay, thanks. So as much as you can source from within your community, I would recommend doing that. And it's really just the people who continue to show up. So the people who are logging in on a regular basis. And I think in many, the best place to start is the people who don't, don't know that this exists and don't know that you value their ideas. And just the people who are just kind of lurking in the backgrounds and you want to shout them out and say, I see you. I appreciate you. Let's do this together. Very cool. Um, related question from Ellie. Um, what have you seen as the conversion rate from lurkers to super users? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's low. Like I would say probably there's like one in 10, like carry over through every part of the journey. So the lurkers who become, you know, kind of like the casual users, the drop-off is probably like, I would say probably about one in 10 at every step of the process. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, question from Giselle. Um, what is the best time to implement this type of program? Is it in the early stage development, expansion, or maturity stage? Not, it's kind I think like you'll know when you need it. Um, you know, I think it's kind of weird to have like an empty community and be like, hey, we are looking for community champions. But you do also want to like be ready so that when you start working with them, you have everything in place. We, for context, we, I would say we started a little late and our community like hard launched in 2017 and like the beginning of 2017. And we had our super users program like fully built out and ready at the beginning of 2019. And I already had like 20 people I had invited by that point. So it was probably a little, a little too late. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, question from Pablo. Um, have you experimented with mentorship programs um, or basically an experienced super user helping beginners get started in the community? We haven't yet, but we're thinking about it. Um, it's in, it's in the works. And it is something we consistently have feedback from, from new champions is like, how do I do this? I think the thing to figure out and that we're trying to figure out is making sure it's kind of like an additional level of value you need to provide for the people who are acting as mentors, because this is basically in some cases them like handing leads to other people and helping them grow their personal brand. So that's the part that we're still figuring out is just making sure that there's enough value there that we are able to position it as to the potential mentors as something they should do. But I would 10 out of 10 recommend investing in that because it's something it'll also help take the work off your plate. If you have other uh, super users who can like help onboard people, that's less questions to you, which, you know, is a good thing. So. Yeah, totally. Um, question from Risha, um, where does the, where does all of this fit in the broader term of building a community and what size of community does it apply to? It applies to every size, whether your community is like six people or 6 million people, I would say you want this in place. Um, it's your members, right? Like your community at the end of the day is always about your members. And putting something like this in place is ensuring that you're prioritizing your members and you're actively thinking about improving the experience for them and actively thinking about how you can get, you know, them to actually connect with their peers. So I would say it's at the core of community building. Um, it's definitely not something that should be put to the side or siloed or anything like that. And the more you can weave it into like your broader advocacy programs, the better off everyone will be. For sure. 
Um, there's a couple of related questions from Ryan and Samantha about kind of like time management. Um, so how do you how do you use um, a set a date meeting model at scale with 100 champions? I'm assuming that um, it's, it's quite a few dates or meetings with everyone who's in the program and probably some that didn't work out. And then Ryan's question is like, uh, what do you say to people um, that kind of have like another full time full time job or maybe are a team of, of one. Yes. Do what you can. Um, I think, you know, these meetings don't have to be, they can be 15 minute meetings. This is really just to like make the face to face connection, which I think any, you know, if you've had a meeting with someone after emailing them, you can figure stuff out so much quicker when you just chat in real time, as opposed to going back and forth over email. Um, I would say block afternoons on your calendar. You know, maybe it's like once every other week you hold meeting space for just chatting with these folks. And if you're doing 15 minute meetings, even if you put like a two and a half hour block on there, you'll be able to get quite a few in um, and it will pay off in spades. I think that's the key here. Scaling is obviously so important, but the more you can retain that human connection and make these people feel like you aren't super busy and you know, whatever, the more they're going to appreciate that and give back. So I would say schedule time every other week if you can, if you, you know, obviously other commitments do take precedent. You know, if you have a deadline on a huge project, maybe pause for a month. Um, you could also go through like recruiting seasons, which some other um, programs do where you like accept applications and kind of batch welcome people. And then you can time manage so that you're taking, maybe it's only like a two week period and for three or four days during those two weeks, you're taking all those meetings to kind of filter people out. Um, so if you're not able to do it on like an ongoing basis annually, you could try like the recruiting, you know, in Q1 and inviting in Q2 or whatever works for your company. Awesome. That's great advice. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. Um, so a question here from Patty. Um, do you have a structure for your super user manual and what are the non-negotiable segments and uh, what do you think is optional? We do have a structure. So it's like the guidelines, what's expected of them. Um, and then one of the best sections we have is like exclusive tips and tricks, basically. So there's some links that we give them within our community to give them quick access to unanswered threads. Um, there's, we give our champions like a signature tool within the community so they can have a little personal branding there. Um, and we have like some templates for that in there. So those I would say would be the non-negotiables is just what's expected of you, what are you getting? And then a little delight, you know, a little something that makes them realize straight away that they're getting the good stuff. I love that. That sounds awesome. Well, I, I do see there, there's a bunch of other great questions. I, I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of them, but Jenny, you did such a great job just kind of like lightning round, giving some, some great information, but really getting through a lot of these. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, um, please make sure that you join us in Slack um, and in our Facebook group if you haven't done so yet. Um, so just visit cmxhub.com um, and then go to community and then you'll find the links to join um, both of those online communities and we can keep the conversation going in there and you know you can get answers from from folks from within the community um so i'd love to see you in there um with that i just want to say a huge thank you again to jenny for this great master class and for sticking around to do this q a with us um i'd love to do a standing ovation but <laughs> since we're virtual let's light up the chat um so please everybody throw in the applause emoji fire emoji whatever your favorite emoji is um just to give a huge thank you to jenny thanks everybody this was so fun and nice to see so many friendly faces in the chat too thanks everybody for coming out Awesome. And yeah, please stay tuned for our next masterclass. Um, so that's going to be coming up on October 27th. And you can find all the information on that um, in, in, the, in the coming days on cmxhub.com as well and in our Slack. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Bye. Bye.